So in today's um, satsang, I thought we'd um, go into questions fairly early on. Um, the satsang might be a bit shorter than usual um, if we do it that way. Um, but I thought rather, well, it's it's good to get people's questions and uh, I, the feedback is, you know, when people hear the questions that other people have, um, they can see where their understanding is and um, not not the questioner but their own understanding and often a, a lot of the same queries are um, voiced by by other people so um, that's what we'll do so if you have questions or comments or um, want to interact then stick your hand up now and um, we'll we'll go to questions soon so you know I try to explain the um, topic in um, more and more detail um, simply to try and get beyond obstacles, um, whatever the obstacle is that is preventing um, a seeing um, of what's being said. And if it's described from all sorts of angles to try and um, allow someone to see, what it means is there's a lot of words. And actually it might, for some people, be complicating something that's really quite simple. Um, so all of the words are there for the situations where what is really simple um, doesn't land. And... That's not because um, people people are stupid or anything like that. It's it's because um, the structure is sometimes so configured in a certain way that life is seen so much that way that a description to the contrary just doesn't have any traction and um, so then the job is to try and find find an opening in um, again find a foothold in having said that um, that's not always the case or always needed so describing it really simply can be useful. What is what are the talks about? The talks are really about happiness in daily living. And what is happiness in daily living? It's a certain um, output, a certain experience that we have um, in life. And when we look at that experience of life, essentially, and we want to convey how it differs from, let's say, the experience of life where we would say, well, I'm not happy or I haven't been happy. When we look really closely, based on our own experience, if our experience is one where we can say we are happy and so there are people throughout history um, who have said, yes, I can say my life is happy. I am happy um, in life and the normal um, assumption is oh well they have a good life circumstantially they must have um, pleasure 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 but when these people describe their happiness what is very evident is it isn't about a life of pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. The, the happiness that they describe is not um, a happiness of outcomes. It's something much more fundamental. It is um, a happiness based on something unchanging, something that is available in any circumstance. 
And it turns out that as we listen more and more, um, the pointers say it's about turning inward. And turning inward really means not being invested, not looking for yourself and your happiness out in outcomes. So for as long as that looking for outcomes or for happiness in outcomes is there, essentially we're not looking inward. And so these descriptions are given that said happiness is available in life. It's not common at this point in time simply because our structure gets formed in a way that looks outward and looks at all of the circumstance that is pleasurable or painful and then is heavily invested in life turning out a certain way and that and that's the key we become heavily invested in life turning out a certain way which means we have um, an expectation we have a picture of how we want life to be and life is life is turning out and it's a bit it, it's life is driven by a force that is not listening to what we would like and it's it's happening so the analogy that i've used is that life is like an avalanche um, we could liken it to an avalanche coming down the mountain it has its own life um, to it and it's going to go where it's going to go and um, us looking at the avalanche and telling it to move a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right is futile. It just doesn't work like that. And when we've, um, as we've developed, we've essentially assumed that my completeness has become a, 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 an identity, a psychological identity that has said, I will be complete one day when life looks the way I want it to look like. And that identity essentially keeps us um, disconnected. Disconnected from a happiness that exists or can exist, can exist exactly with life exactly the way it is. And so what is this happiness when it's described? It's described as the absence of suffering, the non-arising of suffering, the end of suffering. Not described as the in in its in a positive sense. That's not to say it's not a beneficial thing or a, it, it's not beneficial to experience life that way. But it's not described as the gaining of anything, but rather the subtraction, the falling away, the absence of, the non-arising, the end of something. So if we look at a human being as having um, different functions, different um, faculties that function, um, suffering is a layer um, that seems to have been evoked in human functioning f for the most part. So you have humans that function biologically. Um, there is, as part of that biological functioning, uh, the biological functions of the organs. Then there are the senses and the pleasure and pain and even certain type of functional thinking um, is biological um, feelings of hunger and tiredness and um, even feelings of um, excitement or sadness in its pure sense sadness in its pure sense is a biological function and so those are all um, layers within the layer of biological functioning and one more layer is the layer of psychological thinking. And in that layer of psychological thinking, we would stick 
guilt and blame and pride and worry and expectation. And that essentially is based on seeing the other in life as an enemy, a competitor or a rival who can take your happiness away based on what they deliver or don't deliver to you. So that you can see is the root um, of our suffering based on the idea that my happiness is dependent on outcomes. And a large degree of outcomes in life are dependent on the other and how they act and what they do and don't do. And not only is our suffering of guilt, blame, pride, worry, and expectation um, based on seeing the other as an enemy, a competitor, and a rival, but really we look at ourself and our actions and we see those actions as being potentially adding to or taking away from our happiness. And so with that um, attitude towards oneself and the other, this additional layer of human functioning kicks in and it's become so habitual that it is ever-present with circumstance, or let's not say ever-present, but... Um, well, to an extent, it is ever-present in that w once the human being um, is awake in the morning, in daily life, um, th you could say there are two layers of this um, psychological me. There is one that has been put in place by the years of seeing life a certain way, and it's pretty... Um, low-level, constant sense of self that is dissatisfied on some level because it is waiting for life to be a certain way. And then there is this um, another uh, more acute or more obvious um, layer of the psychological self that gets triggered when an outcome is specific and especially when the outcome is pain in the moment delivered by your own actions or the actions of the other or by life in general sometimes you know if a tree fell on your car um it wasn't the other or um yourself and then there's a general blame towards life for delivering pain and so our unhappiness is this attitude towards what's happening where we're essentially um, always feeling threatened by what's going to come next always feeling uncomfortable because of the fact that our sense of self feels and uh, we have a sense of self that thinks it is added to or subtracted from based on the outcomes in life. And so that's a description it's really describing how humans have developed to function. So the majority of humans have developed according to their design and look out in life and expect and try to control life for it to be pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Feeling like that's the only place that the pleasure in life is the best we can hope for less pain and more pleasure. And in that attitude, there's a sort of gold mine that is at the core of the human being that is um, 
unmind. And it's this core of, our, of, of who we are, which really means when that layer of suffering um, quietens down and there is a connection to the in, inward, the internal, the core of who we are, that's when we find, ah, oh, this, is, this is the essence or the core or the heart of the human that is spoken about so often. And it's when we connect to this space I'm speaking of that we realize that the psychological me is really um, all thought-based. And when we start to appreciate the um, unreality of thought, in a sense, the, the, the substancelessness of thought. Now, when I say substancelessness, that, that's amazing that that, that that actually comes out. <laughs> When I say the substancelessness of thought, I don't mean that thought is not powerful. Thought has an amazing capacity to affect the experience of life. But when we really get to see behind the curtain of thought, we find it's it's nothing compared to the heart of who we are. So that's why um, this movement towards self is often referred to as a movement towards truth, a movement towards the real, a movement towards the absolute, um, a falling away of identification with the relative. Now, I wouldn't say that that's um, in itself an absolute truth. I think those words are used um, liberally, but for good reason. And the encouragement, hopefully, in what I'm describing is that if you see this blaming, this guilt, this pride, this worry, this expectation, notice it as what I've been describing, the arising of a thinking movement that I'm describing as the psychological me. So within that thinking movement, there is a sense of... Uh, a, an idea of who I am and it's a conceptual based who I am when the thought falls away the conceptual based me that is suffering falls away with it so if you see this blame to the other just see it for what it is um, which what I mean see it for what it is is see yes I'm blaming the other and the blame is creating a disturbance in the present moment. That's all. It's not even suggesting to stop it. It's enough to see what previously was unseen. And that's why the concepts are put forward, the descriptions are put forward. What very often happens is I try to point out this blame, which is blaming sometimes for whole groups of society that have congregated together, whole areas of society um, that act a certain way. And there is a judgment and a blame, an invalidating of those people or those um, parts of life. That's blame. 
And so for us to just see it and say, yes, that's what happens through me. I am, am designed, like the majority of humans, to see the other as a separate, independent entity, meaning see the other um, separate from the whole. We are designed to see the trees and the flowers and the sun and the clouds, the cars, ourself, all as separate, independent objects. And as a result of being designed by life that way, and I'm really talking about a neural structure that interprets life the way I've just described it. As a result, we're forced to feel guilt and blame and pride. I did that. Look how good I am. That's pride. I did that and I'm really such a failure. That's guilt. You did that. You shouldn't do that. That's blame. Expectation. Life needs to turn out this way in order for me to be happy. Worry is this sense of dread and fear, um, anxiety that life won't turn out the way that will keep me or make me happy. So for us to see this layer, which can be referred to as our attitude to what happens, and to own it, not in a personal doership sort of way, but own it in such a way that we can call it what it is and say, yes, I blame the other for having a different idea to me. I blame the other for not liking the things I like. I blame the other for wanting things that they like that are different to the things that I like, and by them wanting it, they're essentially competing for the things I want, because they're asking for something different. And I want them to ask for what I want, so that we can get, as a society, what I want. And if that doesn't happen, and they are putting pressure on the system to deliver what they want instead of what I want, then I hate them. I blame them for not agreeing with me, for not supporting me in my quest for what I want. So this is an attitude of attachment to outcomes, meaning the deeply ingrained sense of self, which is a psychological me, that believes itself to need external outcomes. And that falls away if we connect to the heart of ourself that is and is free from the psychological me, is the absence of the psychological me. So it's attachment to outcome and it's the belief in personal doership that sees myself and the other and even a lot of the impersonal or non-human aspects of life as separate and um, not being moved by the whole, not being moved as part of the whole. So when life is described as a happening according to God's will, what that concept is really trying to do is to get you to, or to get the thinking that says it shouldn't be that way, to, to change, to fall away and say, actually, it is this way because of God's will. Now, at some point, um, when a concept has done its work, we might even move away from a, a concept of God's will and say, well, who is this God or what is this God? And our idea of God's will might become 
much less than it was before. And what we're left with is just the, well, it just is. It is the way it is because life is this big force. Um, even, frankly, you could just say even the fo it's just the force of physics. That's enough if it's deeply understood. Um, not physics doesn't need to be understood, but just the, the fact that life is happening because the initial impulse happened, what's described as the Big Bang, and so now everything is moving um, as part of the momentum of the initial impulse that is rippling through time, has become the movement of time and space. And so these words and your thoughts and your actions and the scratching of your ear and the falling of a leaf is really just the unfolding of that initial impulse through time and space. And if our attitude could line up with it, we'd stop saying, well, I think it should be different. The initial impulse shouldn't be looking like this. It should be looking like I would like it to look like. At some point, um, often when we've gone through a process of looking at it all, all of it as God's will and having maybe a more elaborate idea of God at that time than we might at some later point, in the end we're just left with, well, the truth is life's always going to be one way in each moment. And if my attitude is to, to reconcile with the fact that it is that way, instead of to not be in reconciliation with the way it is, then what we find is that reconciling with what is is peace of mind, the absence of guilt and blame and pride and worry and expectation. And resisting what is really is the arising that resistance is judgment, um, blame, shame, expectation, worry, and so on. And you, you and I can't um, start or stop the suffering. So it might sound like what I'm saying here is um, you need to, as a doer, stop um, resisting life, stop blaming the other. But rather that's what I've said is a description of what might happen if life changes us, if the impulse from the initial movement turns out that way, then it will be that way. So if you find yourself hearing the words as a prescription of something to do and then you apply yourself um, to do it and it doesn't happen, don't be surprised. And if it does happen, then be grateful. Okay. Hey, how are you going? Hello, Roger. Hello, hello. I had quite some flop, flop the last days. Uh huh. And you and your simplicity of sharing yourself today um, maybe brought me back to the substancelessness of my kindergarten, in my own head. Uh-huh, very good. What a relief. <laughs> uh, we can't hear you anymore, you've gone mute. Hear you? Oh, okay, we had an unstable connection. We're back again. Very good. Um, somehow I'm just blaming myself 
uh, that I'm not enlightened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't this crazy? It, uh, it's nuts. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. It is. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if that falls away, then you're enlightened, right? Because enlightenment is... Know. Well, but enlightenment, according to the concept here, is just the absence of those movements. So, um, the the funny thing is the blame, blame, blaming ourselves for not doing it well enough is just another layer of unenlightenment. And um, when we see, when, when it clicks, when it's like, stop. And... That's it. Stopping is is getting us closer. It's um, interesting for me to see when I go out because I need to go to the st to the store to buy some food, and I see people running around with masks. And then I think about cookie machines, and I still get afraid of being. Um, diminished by other people, of being destroyed by the stupidity of other people. But I see that this is just another layer of thinking. And um, gratitude, Roger, for your teaching and your clarity. And it's so simple. It's, this is the most difficult part for me, the simplicity. Uh -huh. um, yes. And so there must be a very good reason why it doesn't happen for um, so much of society, given it's so simple. Um, and that's the core of the uh, message, right? That it's uh, out of our hands, really. But once life makes it obvious and makes, and makes us see the simplicity of it, then I think there's much to be grateful for. Who's, who's next? Frank. Hi, Frank. Hey, Roger. Good morning. Or, yeah, good good evening to you, right? Yes, it is over here. Good to see you. Uh, question. So, uh, uh, I. I can't hear you, Frank. I think we've got bad connection happening. I guess we'll have it together, but I'll, I'll give it the best shot I've got. So it has to do with, with uh, you. And a lot of what you were talking about today kind of hit on it, but not quite. I didn't get the, quite, the answer I wanted. Maybe it's, I know it's the mind that wants to know the answer, but something in me wants to know the answer. Um, and it has to do with uh, identity and self and... Uh, the, I, I do get, I do understand the concept of, no, of the non-doership, uh, but there is still that gnawing uh, question in me about what it is that interprets life, you know, what is it that uh, registers communication from others. There, there's a lot of depth there. Like, I know there's a, there's, there's a lot of depth in all of us where we can communicate with each other, we can remember what they said the day before, or we can go back in time. There's memory there, there's, there's interpretation. Uh, and I still don't have a good grasp on what that is. There's no, it's not a who, it's not a me, but it's something, or, or, or it's something. Mm -hmm. Maybe not a thing, something. So can you touch on that? Maybe, uh, maybe something will land today. Um, yeah, so... What it, um, uh, I I might as well say it's it's a machine that does all of the complex things: the memory, the registering, the understanding. That um, you know, we should stop at red lights, go at green lights. Um, the intuitive 
understanding, which really is probably just a result of a lot of um, subtle information that the body is picking up and then producing a, a, a conclusion. Um, so all of these faculties that we have, including... Um, or, or, yeah, I, I, I would just say, well, they're there um, and the individual person isn't creating those, isn't controlling those. Um, so at least from the point of view of the one um, let's say, asking the question or from the point of view of the one living their life, which really means the experience of or the sense of Frank, the sense of Roger, from that point of view, all of those things are happening because of some force or some design or some machine um, we could look at the human body and the brain as the machine and then everything that we know as the um, the output of that machine and so the one that asks the question is part of the output of that machine um, and so if we if we if we at least realize I'm not the one that created whatever the source of all these faculties is, I didn't create it and I'm not controlling it. Um, that's really what non-doership is pointing at. Um, at its at its core, because once that's um, understood, the commentator is always on this. The commentator, the sufferer, is the one that clearly doesn't create the capacity to be aware, the capacity to register things, the capacity to move and talk, and um, so when it hits home to that narrative, to that commentator, to that entity that is judging and whatever, that all of the things it is judging is or are happenings that it is aware of, but not happenings that it controls. And so if it can put itself or see the other in the same way and see oh the other the other human being also has a sense of self that maybe is commenting on life and that sense of self is after all of the functioning and is in fact itself an output or a result of all of the functioning so our sense of self appears in life and we don't appreciate that we don't appreciate that the very sense of frank is an output is a creation and then that output that creation is created to go around saying i should have done it differently not realizing that the commentary the I should have done it differently has nothing to do with the things that happened the things that happened happen way before the commentator that comes in and says I should have done it differently the commentator is convinced it is the doer of all the things that happen and the commentator is not the doer of all the things that have that has happened. And once the commentator figures that out, it stops saying, I should have done that differently. 
because it realizes, oh, I'm not the doer of those things. And I'm identified, I've become the, the commentator, which is, the commentator is simply a, a thought movement, has become identified with those things and said, oh, I did them. And when it realizes it didn't do them, they happened, it stops saying, I should have done them differently. And then it looks at the other and it goes, oh, the other isn't the doer of whatever's happening. The, the other is, is like the commentator. They're an afterthought. They, um, they're experiencing life. And the bodies, the bodies are functioning. So if the commentator sees that it is not the body but a thought, then it might stop commentating, comment, commenting in the way that um, it does. Okay, um, so, uh, you know, as you were talking, there were, there were questions coming up in me. There were, there were thoughts coming up in me. Is that coming from the psychological me, the false sense of self, or is that coming from consciousness? Where is that coming? Where are those thoughts coming from, those questions and those thoughts? They're, they're coming from the machine that is doing doing and producing everything. Um, so those, those questions are happening. And we, and they often happen in a way that includes in them the sense, I am doing them. Um, and so on, it, it's simply a matter of the happening happening differently. If the happening happens differently, then the sense of um, I am asking the question um, falls away. And then what is seen is that a question is being asked, that asking a question is happening. And it's really as simple as that. Um, which, when I say it's as simple as that, it's not your doing. So it's, it's simple in the sense that we can describe it as the content of the thoughts, the, the makeup of the thoughts, create one experience or they create another experience. One is the experience that um, all of these th movements, speaking, thinking, are happening and the other is, I am doing them. There is, there is something, that, uh, like there's a knowing, like when I have these thoughts right now as I'm speaking, there's something that's knowing that this is going on. Like I see, my, I see the thoughts coming out, I see the speech coming out, words <laughs> being spoken. Uh, that's what? What is that? That's a happening. It's just a happening? It's a happening. But I'm, I'm watching, something's watching the happening. Right, okay. So you could call it, you could say that's the witnessing of life as a happening. Is that consciousness is what we call it? And I know words don't matter, but I just, I have this, at least I know something about consciousness. I don't know something, I don't know a lot about other things, but consciousness is a word that means something to me. Uh, like, it's like a knowing. Is that what that is? So we're... Because, you know, you hear from other, other teachings, you hear that we are, we're consciousness and all that. I know that, I know that you've taken me in a different direction with this. I, I'm more open to other ideas. But is that what that is? Is like the knowing of my thoughts that are, and the words that are coming out and then hearing your words. Is that, is that what we call consciousness or some people call consciousness? Sure. Um, you, well, you could say, you can say that. Um, if we keep it more or less metaphysical, it's just the functioning of the human without the overlay of the psychological me saying, I am the doer of everything that happens in life. So the witnessing of all these things as a happening could just be a layer of the human being aware of life as a happening, 
but what is primarily at the at the base of the witnessing is awareness or consciousness so yes um, that's why it's described as consciousness because when the thinking component is falling away then there is just the seeing of life happening so there is a silent a seeing that speaking is happening a silent seeing that thinking is happening um, and it's only a silent seeing because let's say it's deepening enough um, the perspective of not being involved not being identified with the thinking is 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 deepening and so then we find that our functioning can be described as oh yes even while I'm talking there is a aspect that is seeing the talking happen and um, that really is the is a shift towards the experiential sense that what I am is not the doer, but the witness of everything that is happening. And that confuses me because it makes me feel like if that's the real me, if that's the true self, it's almost like I'm just watching like a train wreck. Sometimes my life is kind of like a train wreck and I'm just watching it and it's, it just feels very passive. Uh, but I, I Okay, so I don't, I, don't know if, I don't even know if I want to get down that road, but down that road. But I have a question about this and like in memory, uh, like you and I are talking now, and I feel like this is something that, you know, like it's this is something that it's an experience that I'm having that I'll be able to remember, and it's part of my life and this and part of my experience, and it's something that's gonna, uh, like it's not something that's real. But is this all happening just in thought? And when this, is this all going to go away someday where I'm just not going to remember, remember any of this and it's really kind of meaningless and in some ways, if you know what I'm talking about? Um, yeah, well, I, I think in deep sleep we see that, that there is um, the falling away of any appreciation of life having happened. Um, and so memory and all of the, these things tends to be more useful as part of the life, daily life experience. Um, but in deep sleep and as the, the, <clears throat> the model of death that makes most sense to me, not to say that this is absolutely how it is, but a lot of the other um, possibilities seem more far-fetched to me. So my standard um, perspective is the assumption without being heavily invested that once we die there is no more personal consciousness um, linked to this particular body mind and all of the memories um, don't go um, don't go to a roger after death after life um, so death is the end of the Roger experience and and so from that point of view yes all all of um, what has happened in the past is really just um, kept alive by our memory and by how it has um, collapsed into into our genes and up-to-date conditioning Um, I can't hear you, Frank. Oh, I think. Oh. Okay, yeah, I think, you, I think you were frozen for a while. I missed part of what you said, but I, um, if you don't mind, can I just? And I just, I know there are other people. I want to end this, but as you were talking, I'm thinking like I'm, I'm bringing this up about memory because uh, my mom is her her memory is 
she's losing a lot of a lot of her memory, and uh, it makes me question a lot of things about life in general mm-hmm. and how important memory really is. Sometimes thinking if you know if life is about the present, is memory really that important? Uh, but it's important to her because she's suffering because of it. She she knows what's what's going on, and she's suffering because of it. And it makes and I'm suffering because of it too. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, what do you think about memory in general, and uh, what, how 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 significant is it in, in the scheme of things and well of life and stuff? Um, memory is very significant in terms of functionality. Um, so, if we're attached to certain functionality, which really means if we're insistent that we continue functioning a certain way, then <clears throat> because memory is important for certain functionality. If we lose our memory, we lose that functionality. And if we're attached to that functionality, we're going to have a problem. Um, And given the identity that um, is in place, if people start seeing their their functionality collapse, then their sense of self the the sense of self that has been reinforced through their whole life, which is a sense of self that is based on getting somewhere, doing something, achieving something. If that gets impaired and they see it being impaired, then they feel very threatened. It's like, how am I going to ever get a sense of, um, a a sense, a a stronger sense of self, like a, a, a more fulfilling sense of self if I see myself now not being able to function in a way that's going to be able to give me pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Um, and and so then a lot of frustration will kick in, which is um, p- mostly attitudinal. So if someone was to understand, yet the body's going to get old and for some people... You get to the age of, you know, even 50, 60. And um, and for some people who have certain illnesses, it's much younger than that. And then the body stops working. You can't lift things. You can't walk. You can't um, move around the way you used to. Now, if we have a strong identity around that, around moving around, about making, being able to do things, being independent... As soon as that gets threatened, our sense of self gets heavily threatened. So it's the same with with memory. Um, so it, it's really very much about our attitude. If we understand, yes, the body's going to fail and I'm not going to be able to do those things anymore. So if one can just reconcile with that, then there'll be peace of mind. And the reconciliation with these changes usually happens if our sense of self is already a sense of self that is not dependent on outcomes, but rather a sense of self that is fulfilled by an inner connection. And so then the the faculty of memory falls away, the faculty of um, lifting and walking and uh, falls away, and there's an inward turning and saying oh you know that's okay i'm sitting in my chair and i am i'm looking out of the window and here's life and what is aware of life is is the alive part what is aware of life is not the um, memory what is aware of life is not the um, functionality of the body and whether it can you know, look after itself and all of that. It really does come down to how we reconcile with these changes. I, I, I'm, yeah, I, I hear. I guess it's the, like the whole attitude thing that comes into play here. I'm trying to help my mom. She's 90, and I'm trying to help her, uh, you know, deal with it. And I tell her, I said, you know, you can't. She thinks she's losing herself. And I said, no, you, Ma, you cannot lose yourself. You might be losing one of your faculties, uh, whatever, but you're not losing yourself. And I don't know where that comes from, but I kind of feel that, that we really can't lose ourselves. I, Anyways, I, thanks, Roger. I, I think you're spot on. I mean, what, what you've said there is you can't lose yourself is so true. That's what um, the teachings are saying. You know, we're, 
we're um, that's why the teachings say we're already enlightened because they're saying that your true self doesn't come and go, doesn't change, isn't the psychological me, but it gets covered up. <clears throat> um, and so what you've said is spot on. You can't you can't lose yourself. However, in experience, if someone is um, knows themselves through a conceptual structure of who they are then once that structure starts um, failing the actual sense they have is a sense that who am I anymore I, I don't know I don't recognize myself because the 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 structure they had of themselves is now falling apart um, and so even though you're I guess theoretically correct the reason why someone feels like that they are losing themselves is because of this identification with a part of themselves that is um, I guess what you'd say not the real self but rather an identification with faculties Thank you. do you have any what to say to somebody who's in that position how to, how to help and cope um not specifically i think it um it's it's very particular as to you know um what the right thing to say is and i guess comfort is if if i had to um suggest to someone to pick one thing i would pick understanding and comfort um uh, above anything else Great, thanks, Roger. I appreciate your time here, and thanks for uh, thanks for the sad song today. Appreciate it a lot. You're welcome, Frank. Thanks for dropping in. Hi, Violet. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. So, hello. Um, yeah, so I wrote down uh, what I wanted because uh, it's easier for me to read it out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I uh, tell you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so so I see uh, this uh, mind-body complexum as a character who is playing in a cartoon and I'm just sitting back and watching the episodes. It doesn't matter what she's up to or what she's feeling, because I, meaning the self with capital S, uh, is aware of the fact of her ever-changing nature, such as her feelings, thoughts, behaviors, habits, circumstances, and moving objects around her. A few months ago, it has finally clicked what does it actually mean that she is an experience, and that everything she experiences are all playing out in her mind. A shift happened, but it cannot be described with words because it is not a feeling, thought, or sensation. So viewing it from this perspective, she and her life is perfect as it is, and except being grateful for your character, sharing what you share, there is no reason for me to call you. <laughs> Uh, but she's contemplating calling you since weeks now, and I thought, okay, why not then? Uh, I am not a fan of uh, modern psychology and uh, labels, but for the sake of expression, the thing is that uh, she has eating disorders since uh, 17 years. Uh, so she has, and actually always had uh, difficulties with dealing with another life steps like eating, sleeping, <laughs> connect to people. Uh, I don't judge her um, or anything uh, happening um, with her anymore, so I'm fine with it. I'm not seeking any solution or um, have any expectation, but I admit that she is quite exhausted from this. So that's all. <laughs> mm. I think that's uh, beautiful. Um. I uh, I heard exactly what you said. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, remain remain watching her and uh, see what happens. 
Yes, I'm, I do that. Mm. Thank you. Thank you really for you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. On that note, that was very beautiful.